I am Conrad Wetzel, and sitting down with us today are Sarah Balgoyan and Lee Courtney, who work with a program called the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice, or IBARJ, it's called IBARJ, Strengthening Community Through Restorative Practices. And we're very interested in what they have to say because it uh, impacts our community in a lot of ways. Uh, Sarah, I'd like for you to say something about yourself by way of introduction. Sure. And then, Lee, if you would also chime in. So. Sure. Um, as Conrad said, I'm Sarah Bell Goyan, and I am the operations manager with the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice Project, a nonprofit organization. Um, I live here in Champaign and grew up in Urbana and um, really enjoy the work that we do to help our community and our youth uh, across the state. And uh, my name is Lee, and I am a member of the AmeriCorps VISTA program. Uh, I'm from the Chicago area, uh, but for the past year I've been living and working in Champaign with uh, iBarge and the Champaign-Urbana Area Project. Well, begin by telling us uh, what this program is and how you came to be involved in it, and just what does it do for the cities? Sure. Um, the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice Project um, is a statewide nonprofit that helps train and promote um, in restorative practices, the often, um, often referred to as restorative justice as the kind of shorter name for it. And I have been here now three years. My background is actually um, more in business management and that's kind of my role, but I'm very passionate about this work. Um, because of the life-changing effects it has on youth um, and, and how it really helps our community come together by building relationships and repairing harm. Um, so I really enjoy what I do. Sarah, if I could ask. Sure. A lot of people probably are unfamiliar with the term restorative justice. Could you take just a moment to define that for Yeah, us? Um, absolutely. So restorative justice um, is kind of a different way of thinking about um, how we respond when something has gone wrong. Um, oftentimes it's in the criminal justice system um, focused on crimes instead of looking at who broke the law and um, you know how are we going to punish them. We focus more on what harm was caused and how can that be repaired? So, um, for example, uh, if a youth uh, commits a crime, let's say, just for example, actually, let's say my child were to break my neighbor's um, window with a baseball by accident, how would I respond to that? I would really want my kid to go next door, to admit to their mistake, to apologize, and to make it right. Um, finding a way to help repair the window um, financially mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. physically can they help out and build that relationship and continue to maintain that relationship uh, with their neighbor. Um, and so in the justice system it's very similar. We want when, some, when a young person or even adult makes a mistake, uh, breaks a rule or a law, um, we want them to repair that by um, learning how it affected the victim and the community as well as figuring out how to repair that and not do it again. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, very good, and we'll talk more in detail about mm -hmm. it. Lise, how did you come to be involved in this program? Uh, well, I uh, graduated two years ago uh, with an undergraduate degree in uh, sociology, and uh, in school I had uh, learned quite a lot about um, the justice system and uh, sort of the way that it has um, become really distant from uh, more traditional and more almost common sense ways of, of dealing with um, offenses. And I learned about uh, iBarge when I applied to the AmeriCorps VISTA program and uh, fortunately was placed here and realized that restorative justice was really the name for uh, what I learned as sort of just the best way of dealing mm -hmm. with uh, crime and punishment. Well, I'm sure you're finding it very meaningful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. Now, I want to hear from you what each of you does in relation to your, to your job. Let's begin with you, Sarah. What do you do? Sure. Um, technically, as the operations manager, I do a lot of the business aspect, um, you know, accounting and, and other things. But um, because we're kind of a small nonprofit, meaning there are 
myself and Lee <laughs> and one other person that really work uh, in the organization, uh, we kind of do a little bit of everything. So we um, provide and support trainings across the state. Uh, we work under grant funding, so wherever our grant is, we do a lot of work um, with that. We partner with communities um, and organizations in communities, like for example in Champaign, we work with the Champaign-Urbana Area Project to promote restorative practices um, and also the Access Initiative. And um, What is Access Initiative? Sure. Access Initiative is a um, federally funded community project to provide um, sustainable services for our community that are all integrated. Um, oftentimes it's called wraparound for our, our kids mm. um, so that every um, possible way that a kid might be involved in a system, they're all communicating and working together for better outcomes for the youth and the parents. So Access Initiative here locally works as, is located at Community Elements at the Department of Mental Health and they work with them as well as schools and DCFS and the Juvenile Detention Center and, and many, many, many more organizations to take care of all of our... It sounds people. like it's quite an innovative program, bringing together the uh, benefits of a variety of services in our community. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's kind of what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lee? Sure. Well, um, as an AmeriCorps VISTA, really our primary responsibilities are um, sustainability and capacity building of the organizations in which we're placed. Um, it's a, a national program, and I technically serve as a full-time volunteer um, funded by the government. And um, so my main charge is really to help iBarge um, sustain its programs. And um, so a lot of the time that involves helping out with um, funding, uh, grant writing, and um, other is just helping to expand um, and strengthen our programs um, wherever they may be, whether they're locally or uh, in Chicago or otherwise uh, around Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just uh, support in whatever way I can. Well, I'm sure you're finding it quite uh, meaningful to be involved in this Absolutely, way. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. As you began your studies, mm -hmm. uh, you, you were imagining where, where you might end up, what you might be doing, in what ways you'll have, make an impact on the community, mm -hmm. and now you're finding out. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, yes. Well, now, uh, you have a list of things that you're involved in. Why don't you just start going down this list and telling us about them? Both of you be involved. Sure. Um, I think, you know, what I, if you don't mind, I'd like to a little bit just talk about the benefits of restorative justice. Oh, yes, and, please do. And some of the things that um, we feel so strongly about. And, and I gave that example. Um, but there are three main stakeholders when a harm is committed, uh, victims, the offenders, and the community. And oftentimes in our current system, um, they are all not, aren't all involved in the outcome. So um, for juveniles especially, victims aren't even allowed in the um, court system to be a part of it. Um, so with restorative justice, we um, support communities in providing diversion programs so that youth aren't going straight to the courts to now become deeper involved in the system. Instead, um, for example, in Champaign, they can be diverted to the Regional Planning Commission has a few options. They have peer mediation, um, and when there is a clear victim and who's willing to come and participate. They have peer court where um, the youth are um, had provided an opportunity to sit down with their peers to discuss the harm they caused. Um, they, they have to admit to that mm -hmm. um, before mm -hmm. they are able to do that. And they decide on an outcome together. If they successfully complete that outcome, it might be community service. It's definitely going to include an apology and, and lots of other um, things that, you know, like keeping your grades up um, often is, is something that's an outcome on these contracts. And then if they complete that successfully, they don't go to court. They now know they don't have a record and they don't become involved in our system that way. And also they are hopefully learning um, some new skills, empathy and, um, and other things that they might not have had before. Um, Which will make it much less likely that they'll get into trouble. Exactly. So rec recidivism um, is reduced naturally. Mm -hmm. um, there are 30 years worth of studies that show this. Um, but it's also kind of a common sense thing. We know that if you, if you 
meet your victim, you learn about the harm that you caused, um, you're going to think more about it before you do it another time. You know, oftentimes uh, people who work in a system use terms that the general public may be only vaguely aware of its meaning. Recidivism. Mm. Say something. What is that? Good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, recidivism is uh, really uh, a way of saying the rate at which people reoffend uh, or people who have already been, um, t you know, taken in for something will, mm -hmm. will commit again. Mm -hmm. So everyone benefits if uh, the person does not have to go through the court system again. Absolutely. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. it's expensive. And it's very adversarial. It's yeah. the, uh, the, the victim is set up opposed to the offender mm -hmm. and uh, legal uh, lawyers are in mm -hmm. between. So this program brings us together and uh, that lets each the offender and the victim feel the impact of what happened and to mm -hmm. share that with mm -hmm. each other. Isn't that it is. And, you know, as Sarah was saying, in our current system, the victim's needs are really not taken into yes. account in a, in a real way. It's more assumed that um, putting the offender in prison is what every victim wants, and yeah. that's it. Um, it's really kind of a one-size-fits-all approach that evidence shows really doesn't work most of the time. Mm -hmm. Now, have you had feedback from uh, victims who have gone through this program how do they feel about it compared to, you know, we want justice done and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, victim satisfaction is very high during restorative practices. Um, typically a model like a conferencing model where we would all be sitting down together yes. and, and going through what happened and, and um, how can we repair mm -hmm. this. And they, um, in studies locally, well in Peoria, for example, they have a 98% satisfaction rate. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Ford County's been doing it for, um, 10 years, they also have a high 90s, 98, 99% satisfaction rate. Um, Ford County also, over 10 years, has collected 100% restitution. And that is nowhere near what oh. happens in the yes. actual system. So yes. we want to make sure people know that uh, restorative justice isn't an easy way out. Exactly. You know, victims and offenders, um, the, the offenders still have to make things right and yes. often that has a financial mm -hmm. obligation mm -hmm. can be even um, more challenging yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um, but they can work together in, in the two so a victim might be more um, likely to understand the situation especially if it's a young kid who can't uh, you know have a job or um, mm -hmm. you know has to go to school how are they expected to pay all these court fees and other things but if they are paying it directly to the victim there might be some other ways um, for example volunteering in a store if they mm -hmm. shoplifted from that store um, mm -hmm. could really be a payback in a way that they wouldn't have an opportunity to do that in another in the system and criminal justice system tell something about the satisfaction factor involved in that compared to having to pay fines and spend time in jail and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Often the, not only the victim, but the offenders, the parents, the community, you know, um, the safety of the community yeah. is really um, increased when offenders and victims get to work out what happened. The victims feel safer in mm -hmm. their own community because they now know um, you know, how the person was feeling, that it's a true, real person sitting across from them. Um, and so, yeah, so the satisfaction is increased by everybody, mm -hmm. including the system folks, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So probation and, and judges and others are very satisfied when the, um, when the outcome is positive and we're not sending another youth to prison or another um, adult to prison um, or creating more adult pr criminals by mm -hmm. sending them, you know, to the detention center and other places. And while it's not as important as the personal factors, the financial factor is enormous. Mm -hmm. It's a t tremendous difference in the costliness to the community all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, right now it costs annually $90,000 to keep a kid in jail. $90,000. Um, and a year. And, you know, in Champaign we spend five to $10,000 a year per kid to educate them. Mm -hmm. um, and with restorative justice, you reduce those costs tremendously. Right. Our, our taxes, mm -hmm. um, you know, fines and things that have to go into repairing shoplifting, you know, fees that, you know, prices yes. that have to go up because the store owners have to operate that mm -hmm. way and security levels have to go up. All of those things mm -hmm. you don't think about but the, are the indirect costs of, of our system. Mm -hmm. Do you have some observations about 
the satisfaction factor for people? Well, I just think that it's it's such a win-win situation for everybody involved. Um, you know, if you think about a given case in our current system, the offender is really encouraged to you know deny what they've done or yes. or not um, have to not think about it as you know, the real impact that they've caused. Whereas if they're given a chance to speak to the victim, they get to know them as a person yes. and understand how in a realistic way they actually affected that person, how they affected the community. They have a way to make up for that instead of being put in a room for years mm -hmm. alone. Um, it, it really just is quite a common sense mm -hmm. approach. And the ability to perceive oneself as others perceive you mm -hmm. is a major part of personality development. Mm -hmm. And this enhances personality development on the part of these people. Otherwise, uh, they, they just continue not moving past that uh, uh, the world's out to get me kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very similar in schools. We're starting to use a lot more of the language of restorative mm -hmm. practices. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things that we are um, kind of chuckle about is the consequence for truancy is often suspension or yes. expulsion. <laughs> so, um, you know, truancy being uh, people, kids who don't show up for school, you know, X number of days um, in school end up being considered criminals and can be charged with this. And th the school then, you know, suspends them for more days out of school or mm -hmm. expels yes. them. And now the justice system is going to take them out as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, how does that help, you know? Right. And the parents, mm -hmm. you know, how do they feel about that? They can't. Uh, you know, be happy with that. When all aspects, all of the people involved can become co-workers toward a common goal in contrast mm -hmm. to uh, being on sides and trying to win over the other one, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a much better for the whole community as well as the individuals involved. Yeah, it's really what people have been doing for centuries, you know, yeah, this, uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, you know, say this, that this is not brand new, mm -hmm. we've just come up with this yeah. by any means. <laughs> oh, this true. is, you know, um, a lot of restorative justice actually dates back to Native American times, sitting mm -hmm. in peace circles with your community members and solving problems um, is not, you know, and that's how families have been doing it forever. And, um, you know, this is not new stuff that we're promoting. It's really actually bringing it back to, to treating each other how we want to be treated. It's the golden rule. Mm -hmm. I read uh, recently about a tribe in Africa where if someone in the village offends mm -hmm. in some way, they have, that person has to go out and sit by the roadside. And everybody in the community goes by and speaks to them and tells them, all of the good things about them. Mm, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. You instead of castigating them. Right. And so that, that person begins to see himself or herself in a new light, the way other people see mm -hmm. the good qualities, and they, they can be restored to the community that way. Yeah, because yeah. it's often the action, not mm -hmm. the person, mm -hmm. that we, you know, we need to be focused on. And it's really important to think about what caused that action in the first place, yes. and it may have been a bad sense of self, it mm -hmm. may have been a hundred other factors mm -hmm. that aren't being addressed if you just put them in prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a list of things, and uh, one of them is that working with books to prisoners. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a motto, reading reduces recidivism. Can you tell us something about that? Why would that be the case? Mm -hmm. Why would reading help? Sure. Well, reading is is just one wonderful example of a lot of, of great uh, things that people who have offended can do to kind of regain this sense of self that they maybe didn't have. Um, reading uh, ed educates people. It can teach uh, empathy, being able to see things from another mm. person's perspective. Um, you know, I've heard of programs where uh, theater is involved. Offenders will perform theater productions, mm -hmm. and that's another wonderful way of, of putting yourself in another person's situation. Uh, art can be very therapeutic. It can be uh, educational for whoever is doing it. Uh, really, and evidence really shows that, that programs like this have a lot of success. Um, and, you know, it's, it's great to see some things like this taking off in prisons and, you know, on another level in schools. Um, and so there's really, there's no question at all that, that art and education can be completely transformative. Mm -hmm. I was told by someone who works with uh, Books to Prisoners that one of the most frequently requested book mm -hmm. by a prisoner is a dictionary. Mm -hmm. 
so that they can begin a bit to educate themselves mm -hmm. because they've been helped to see that once they get out of prison, if their education is even enhanced a bit, they're much more likely to get a job and keep that job, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which helps them maintain themselves outside of prison. So the motto, reading reduces recidivism, is certainly an excellent motto. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, and education is, is so key to, mm -hmm. um, to rehabilitation mm -hmm. and reintegration into society. Another local um, organization that focuses on that is called the Education Justice Project. And um, they're under the University of Illinois, but they work over in the Danville prison and mm -hmm. they provide mm -hmm. higher level education classes um, to the inmates there so that, as you just said, when they are released, they come out with some more knowledge than what they gained, you know, kind of this whole idea of corrections, you know, this is the Department of Corrections, how are we actually correcting people and, and making them um, a better person? And I understand from the people who work at that prison the program at the Danville prison, uh, find a prisoner who wants to read, it's almost as if they've been thirsty and they want this good drink of water. Yeah. They just really put themselves into it. Yeah. Yeah, and what better way? Well, I mean, you've got all yeah. this time. <laughs> so. That is true. Yeah, it's wonderful. So it enhances self-esteem so much to be able to read because people, one of the, uh, people will hide the fact that they can't read very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They will uh, add, but if they are helped to read, they feel much better when they go out to fill out a job application. Mm -hmm, they don't mm -hmm. have to have someone sitting there reading it to them because yeah. that's kind of, uh, they, they feel it as self-demeaning. Sure. And that's a benefit to the community too. So, um, so you know, offenders coming out of prison can get jobs mm -hmm. and be, you know, tax-paying citizens and a part of our community, and, and are less likely to reoffend as well yes. when they are educated and are able to find work. Um, so, it's it's also about community s safety. And it sounds like uh, the two of you get a lot of satisfaction out of working with this in the ways mm -hmm. that you do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to tell other people about this? How mm -hmm. do you how do you spread the word about uh, your program? Sure. Well, you know, I'm obviously I like to talk a little, so <laughs> I'm happy to talk to anybody that I can about it. Um, I often get to tell people that I, you know, um, encountered the justice system as a youth, and so I have some real life experience. Um, and this is really the way that. Um, I choose to be as a person, um, treat others how I want to be treated, um, to parent my own child, I want to make sure they learn from their mistakes and, and other things. Um, outside of chatting with anybody who will listen, we <laughs> um, do some great social media, Facebook, website, all that good stuff. Um, and I'll let Lee talk about that because she's kind of our, our hip technology person. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's actually um, become a really important part of what we do. We have um, a great website that, that uh, is really very informative. And that's kind of one of our main roles as an organization is, is just in informing people. Um, it's a statewide network that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, and we also you know can inform people mm -hmm. in the rest of the country and beyond. Um, so the internet is a very powerful tool for us. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we can we can uh, keep people updated on our events and, and invite them to join us um, by putting invitations online, mm -hmm. uh, email, and, and other social media. Um, so that's been a real benefit in getting the word out. I first heard about your work by attending a uh, dinner one evening. Mm -hmm. a, a friend of mine uh, forwarded the information, and so my wife and I went and thoroughly appreciated what we learned. Tell us about that kind of event, and do you have it every now and then? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, partnering together with Champaign-Urbana Area Project and the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice Project as well as the Access in Initiative that I mentioned earlier, we um, just decided to host a community conversation one day. Um, it actually started and began when the hiring of the new police chief was happening in Champaign and uh, we wanted to, to provide an opportunity to the public to um, have some dialogue about that, mm -hmm. as well as ask some questions. What do they want to know about these candidates that were up for that? Um, and it was very successful, so we continued to have them, and we've had different topics. The one you came to was about healing, mm -hmm. how important it is for healing, um, and we plan to have more and get more community members involved in what the 
the subjects and dates will, will be. So if you're interested, please let us know. Um, this is really for the community and by the community. Yep. And uh, how many is of those, like I attended, how many of those have you had so far? That was our third. Third one. Yeah. And uh, are you finding a gradual increase in attendance and a variety of people who come? I saw a number of ministers from churches there. Yeah, as and well all as three police chiefs. Yes, yes. and mm -hmm. there were teachers. And, and there were teachers and other professional people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's great what kind of diversity we're starting to get at these yes. events. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing that shows is that there are a lot of people of goodwill who want the best for our communities mm -hmm. and for the people who live here, and especially our young people. Mm -hmm. And they're eager for ways that they can help young people, but also work together in ways to help young people. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our, our society is full of more people than not who want to work together yes. to help each other. Mm -hmm. And um, often we're, you know, um, sitting in our own silos or, you know, doing our own thing, but coming together to do it is, is the way that it's going to get stuff done. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, I want to thank you very much for coming thank and telling about having. this program. Lee? It's Thank a pleasure you. to have you. Thank you. And we've been talking with them about the Illinois Balanced and Restorative Justice Program, or IBART. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can uh, read about it on their website, which I believe you're able to see on the screen. And you can also, uh, if you want materials, there are ways for you mm -hmm. to obtain these. Where can they pick these up? Well, if you go to our website, you can contact us, and we'd be happy to uh, send you something, or you'll find all the same information on the website. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Or attend one of our events. Attend one of our <laughs> events. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and the website is uh, www.ibarj.org. Mm -hmm. And you can also find more information at the Champaign Urbana Area Project as well. Fine. And that's a local. Well, thank you. I'm Conrad Wetzel, and uh, it's been a great privilege to have you sitting down with us today. Thank you. Take Conrad. good care. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.